Bonjour. Nous sommes Good morning. We're together today to follow live this first launch of Soyuz from the Guyana Space Center, which will place into orbit the first two satellites in the Galileo constellation. You know that this is an historic moment, both for Soyuz at the Guyana Space Center and for Galileo. We have resolved the difficulties which delayed the launch attempt that was set for yesterday, and we're now aiming to launch at 7.30 a.m. in French Guyana, 12.30 p.m. in Europe. After liftoff, Soyuz's flight will last a little more than nine minutes. It will be followed by the first ignition of the frigate upper stage. Just before 8 a.m. in French Guiana, 1 p.m. Europe time, we'll be over the Baltic Sea, and at this time the ballistic phase, lasting 3 hours and 17 minutes, will begin. Then at 11.10 a.m. in French Guiana, 4.10 p.m. in Europe, we'll have the second frigate upper stage burn. Nine minutes later, while we're flying over the Indian Ocean south of Australia, we'll separate the two Galileo satellites. But without further ado, let's watch live from French Guiana this first launch of Soyuz, which will put into orbit the first two satellites in the Galileo constellation. Greetings everybody, wherever you may be, and welcome to French Guyana, the home of the Ariane family for today's launch of Soyuz. And not just any Soyuz, but the very first Soyuz to fly from French Guyana. Joshua Jampel here with my friend Alex Madembasi. Hi Alex. Good uh, morning Josh, good morning everyone. Uh, to all of you who are watching the Ariane Space video transmission, welcome to Kourou for this major event, the first Russian Soyuz in French Guyana. We are now almost ready for liftoff and the final operations are being conducted by a joint Russian-European team from the brand new Soyuz launch pad. Lots of emotion all across the space base, huh Alex? You can feel it. Needless to say that for everyone here, the general feeling is a lot of emotion and excitement while the final launch preparations are ongoing. Alex is from Ariane Space's commercial directorate and he'll have a lot uh, to tell us about the program. A lot of films tonight also. Our first is on the long history of Soyuz. Soyuz was born during the Cold War, the brainchild of Soviet engineer Sergei Korolev. It was first an intercontinental ballistic missile derived from the German V-2 and called R-7 Semyorka. This launcher took off from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan on October 4th, 1957, carrying the first satellite, Sputnik. It was the shot heard around the world. The space race was on. On April 12, 1961, Soyuz launched the first man in space, Yuri Gagarin. Eleven minutes after liftoff, Gagarin went into orbit around the Earth. His flight lasted an hour and 48 minutes and made him a world celebrity. After this space pioneer, the Soviet Union flew many men and women into space and conducted many spacewalks. The Apollo-Soyuz mission in 1975 saw the first ever docking between Soviet and U.S. ships in space. It was six years after the Americans sent the first men to the moon. All Soviet and later Russian manned missions have used the Soyuz launcher, which has become the world's most reliable. The Salyut and Mir space stations were developed and then the International Space Station, enabling man to remain in space for extended periods. France and Russia created StarSem in 1996, a joint venture to operate commercial launches of Soyuz from Baikonur. The first StarSem flight took place in 1999 with four Global Star satellites. The year after, the new Fregat upper stage brought a significant improvement to Soyuz flights to geostationary orbit. To date, 23 StarSem flights have been carried out, all successful, including Mars Express in 2003, Venus Express and Galaxy 14 in 2005, Metop in 2006, RadarSat in 2007, and Jovi A and B, the forerunners of Galileo. Today, Soyuz is writing another page in space history from her new home in French Guiana. 
That new home took two million hours to build, uh, this launch complex. 600 people worked on it. Went up in just 10 years. Quite an achievement. We're going to go back inside Jupiter for a look at some of the key players responsible for the launch. Flight Directorate here, starting off with top management. Alex, you wanted to add some of the history notes to Soyuz. Yes, but the, the, the French Russian Corporation uh, actually started in the early 1960s. And since the first flight of the R-7A missile in 1957, the Soyuz rocket has been modified in nine versions, leading to the most recent ones, the uh, Soyuz U for the ISS missions, cargo and manned flights with astronauts, and the Soyuz 21A and 21B with the frigate upper stage, corresponding to the STA and STB versions in Kourou, French Guiana. Tonight, this morning, the Galileo satellites will fly in an STB version, but now an interview of Jean-Jacques Dordain, director of ESA. Today we are together for a double event. I dare say an historical double event because it's both the first launch of a Soyuz from the Guiana Space Center and the launch of the first two operational satellites in the Galileo constellation. Soyuz at the Guiana Space Center is a wonderful cooperation between ESA and uh, Russia with, uh, of course, our partners, CNES, and Iron Space. Ten years of uh, common effort, ten years of working together toward results that I believe will be well worth it, because seeing the legendary vehicle that launched both Sputnik and Yuri Gagarin take off from this base is more than uh, just technique. It's also very emotional. The first two Galileo satellites represent, again, a lot of combined effort and hard work on part of our industrial partners, the operational teams, the European Commission and the European Space Agency, to ensure that these two Galileo satellites are ready to launch today with Soyuz. ESA has a relatively new role in the mission tonight. Usually the European Space Agency is a coordinator of the missions, I guess you could say. With Galileo, she's taking on quite a larger role. We're going to go back into uh, Jupiter, look at more uh, mission personnel. Alex, we're in what we call negative time before liftoff. What's happening now, and what happened before we came on the air? Yes, so yesterday we fixed the, uh, the problem we had on the ground installations and resumed all the operations uh, to be ready for the launch to this morning. And the uh, um, propellant loading operation started uh, very early this morning. Uh, then the uh, gantry has been withdrawn about one hour ago, and the uh, rocket is now sitting on the forearms, uh, and of the, the full weight of the rocket is, is sitting on the forearms, about 300 and, uh, tons. So this is in four stages. The boosters make up one stage. Then there's the second or the core stage little different than Ariane 5, if you're familiar with that. Then there's the third stage, and the upper stage called Frigat. After liftoff, the flight of the three lower stages will last for about nine minutes. Then the third stage will separate. The nose module consists of the Frigat upper stage and the payload, which are the two IOV satellites. We'll have more on the satellites later on. The Frigat will fire its own engines. There will be two firings. Spacecraft separation will occur in about three hours and 40 minutes from now, roughly. That's a brief overview of uh, you can see what the fairing and, and the white fumes, which are the oxygen venting uh, fumes. You'll be hearing the DDO. There he is. I uh, was it Thierry Villemar, the mission director of Ariane Space, and uh, his uh, colleague and counterpart on the CNET side, uh, Thierry Vallée, the uh, director of operations uh, of CNES, in charge of the coordination of the launch base systems during the final chronology. He's working, of course, in close cooperation with Thierry Villemar, the Ariane Space Mission Director, in charge of all the operations from arrival of the satellite in Kourou up to the launch. You'll hear the DDO call out the major milestones before liftoff and afterward. Thierry Vallée right there, he's going to call out uh, some of the final moments of the final countdown. You'll be hearing his voice in just a moment. A look Based at the... Basically, we have the same organization. At management level, the customer has uh, facing the same organization. So more to learn now about the IOV satellites with the Didier Fevre of ESA.
IOV, ça veut dire IOV means validation in orbit. Why validation in orbit? Well, because before we deploy the entire constellation, we want to check first with a mini constellation of four spacecraft and with a ground segment deployed around the world that the system works according to our plans. Today's launch of two IOV satellites will be followed next year by two others, and that mini constellation will be representative enough of the full operational fleet. These four satellites will be part of the operational constellation and provide Galileo services right from their launch. The IOV satellites are small, weighing 750 kilos, and provide modest power, about one kilowatt. Their platform is simple, but their payload is highly sophisticated. That's why we launched the experimental satellites Jovi A and B first, to be sure the technology developed in Europe works perfectly. Among the most sensitive technology, atomic clocks, something new which use high-quality hydrogen masers. The satellites also have rubidium clocks on board, plus a sophisticated signal generator which can deliver the different Galileo signals around the world. A couple things you might want to know about Soyuz if you don't already know them. 1776 launches to her credit. That's a world record. She's the only launcher today capable of manned spaceflight. Lots of modifications over the year. Remember the first flight goes back to uh, Sputnik. Big and small, one of the big ones is the engine in the third stage which has been totally revamped and now has a digital navigation system that's been on board since uh, 2007. So I guess you could say, Alex, today we have a thoroughly modern launcher based on an old tried and true model, new wine in an old bottle. If you a lot of modifications, but a fully qualified launcher with uh, two minor modifications for the uh, safety device on the first stage boosters and the uh, telemetry device. She's also ecological, we can say 90% of her 9-0 in the first three stages fly in liquid oxygen and kerosene. As for the uh, one, two, and three stages, uh, except for the Fregat, which is fueled with the M M UDMH and the N204. We'll come back on that later. Yeah. Some of the milestones coming up in negative time at uh, minus six minutes. You'll hear the DDO call out uh, in Russian, I think. The key, uh, the, the key on start. Alex will have a word Probably about that. Probably there's the famous key, which is uh, on the uh, launch operations manager, uh, Dmitry Baranov, the uh, Russian uh, launch operations manager. In, it's in his computer desk and it will turn manually the key to allow the launch sequence to continue. You, you see those four uh, what look like radio towers surrounding Soyuz. Those are lightning rod, lightning protection. We have those for uh, Ariane as well. The, the preparation area where the launcher elements are stored on arrival is about a kilometer away from what you're looking at also where the launch center is. We in Jupiter here, we're about, what, 20 kilometers from uh, the pad? Well, yes, we are about 20 kilometers. So the two launch pads are in five. Uh, the Vega launch pad and the uh, uh, Soyuz launch pad are far enough uh, so that the, there is no uh, safety uh, issues that might happen uh, for during the launches. The introduction of the second member of the uh, Ariane family signaling the birth of the most complete range of commercial launchers ever seen with Soyuz and Vega. three launchers and uh, addressing the, uh, all the whole uh, market uh, segment for all the masses of uh, different types of satellites from scientific to telecommunication satellites. We, I think we got confirmation of the, uh, what is it, the Klochna start? We'll go now to Blaz D. Chanteret of Ariane Space for a look at the mission, a little more details. So the Soyuz mission is made of two phases, uh, the three-story phase and the uh, Fregat orbital phase. The three-story phase starts with the launch. Two minutes after that, we have the separation of the four lateral boosters. The flight continues with the separation of the fairing after 3.4 minutes approximately, and then the separation of the second stage after five minutes. The flight continues until about uh, nine minutes into the flight, the Fregat stage then determines whether it has or does not have enough energy to go all the way to the final orbit. It decides to separate then, and then the uh, separated bodies fall into the Atlantic. This continues then with the flight of Frigat with two boosters with the main engine. The first boot, 800 seconds long, enables a transfer of the uh, upper uh, stage and the payload to a next elliptical orbit. And then the second boost, which takes place much later, three and a half hours after liftoff, circularizes this orbit in order to reach the uh, final satellite orbit, which 
which is at 23,000 kilometers approximately. 300 seconds after the end of the second boost, the payload is separated. The two Galileo and IOV satellites are separated simultaneously in two opposite directions. Brigat then continues its mission for five hours until it gets to its graveyard orbit, which is at 300 kilometers above the operational orbit of the satellites. Very concise explanation there by Blaise de Chantonnet of Ariane Space. What's up next? Uh, we have had the uh, meteor meteorological uh, report uh, saying that all the criteria uh, uh, and specific conditions of wind velocity at low and high altitude, cloud thickness and assessment of lighting risks are now uh, green. So uh, you can see on the uh, green panel when we get back to Jupiter that uh, everything is fine on on this side, so the meteor is green for the launch day. That's a, that's a good. Time. That's a good item that we have there. Another similarity with the Ariane flights is the launch management. We're taking the camera up uh, closer to the launch pad. You see what those people are doing. Yeah, we saw Jean-Claude Garot, the launch operations manager on Ariane space side, and now Dimitri Baranov, the launch operations manager on the Russian side. So there are two teams: the uh, European teams and the Russian teams, working in. Pretty close cooperation, and Frank Vasseur are in charge of the uh, production aspects of the of the launcher. So this first Russian and European team uh, cooperation, with who uh, led the people to conduct all the launch space activities, constitute in itself a great multicultural achievement. These people are about. Uh, oh, there's a key on the. Ah, we right. see the key. That's the famous key that turns on the uh, the final yes, launch. Yes, uh, uh, wondering who will uh, keep the key after the launch. Waiting on the pad, just under three minutes. Inside the fairing, the satellite's maintained in cool and clean condition through uh, ventilation inside the uh, inside the launcher. It and looks like he's going to call out uh, one of the final back to Jupiter operations. Waiting for the umbilical mass to uh, be pulled off the launcher. We see this mass with the uh, umbilical plugs, which are connected to the, uh, the satellites base of the fairing and uh, ensure the electrical connection with the satellites. And what happens is they are pulled away. There's the DDO calling out the dis disconnection. Disconnection of, of the, the umbilical plugs. These are and electrical then, umbilicals. And then this big metallic mass will be pulled off the launcher. There, there are connections for the satellites, electrical connections for the lower stage and for the upper stage. So Three the satellites umbilicals. are totally autonomous and uh, on on uh, internal power supply. While well, we are still uh, topping up the uh, oxy liquid oxygen inside the propellant tanks of the first, uh, second, and third stage. Coming up on a minute, we'll be into the final minute, final 60 seconds of this historic uh, first launch of Soyuz. Big crowd on hand, lots of press here, as you can imagine. Witnessing space history. Maybe we should uh, give a rundown on the of the ignition sequence, which you'll see, which is a little different than Ariane. Yeah, this what sequence uh, starts approximately 17 seconds before liftoff, and the 20 engines will be ignited first at low thrust level, then intermediate level, and finally full level, enabling the propulsion the DDO is going to call out the one minute mark now and we'll be into the final 60 seconds before liftoff. Top, moins une minute. So we are within the last minute before liftoff. You can't hear, you can hear a pin drop here in Jupiter. People are so attentive. They're starting to go out here, the invited guests going out on the terraces on either side here. They're going to watch the launch from outside. Remember what Alex said, at minus uh, 15 seconds, the first controlled ignition at a weak pressure, minus 7 seconds, and a second one, an intermediate pressure, testing the engines about 50%, monitoring them while it's still on the pad. And then at minus 3 seconds, the order is given for the third and final phase at full throttle. We'll let you Largage watch. There comes the umbilical, right on time. We're ready to go. We'll let you watch the liftoff, and we'll be back with you after Soyuz has cleared the tower. Enjoy it, everybody. Top, début de séquence d'allumage lanceur. Largage de quête, nous approuvons. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, top, décollage.
Well, there you have it. A page of space. History has just been written, and you were present at its creation, as were we. Alex is almost in tears next to me. Yeah, you were, you were cheering. So is on. And gorgeous. Beautiful uh, lighting up the, uh, uh, the morning sun. The DDO is saying everything is fine on board. Soya is lifting off perfectly from the soil here in her new home in French Guiana, Guyana, beginning her mission number 1777. These pictures will go around the world. They're already on the Internet. You'll see them in the papers and TV tomorrow. Uh, 313 tons at liftoff, less than half of the mass of uh, Ariane 5. Alex, on the left, on the upper part of the screen, what are we looking at? Well, the white curve, which shows the uh, flight prediction, which is entirely computed, and the white spot uh, on the curve shows the real-time position of the launcher. This position is regularly sent by the launcher telemetry system and received by the tracking stations and then sent to Kourou, and uh, where it is transmitted to the computers here in Kourou. And, uh, can see the curve and the spot on it. So you can follow that <laughs> along with that. The DDO says everything is normal on board. On the lower left, the two bottom lines, A and V. On the lower left, then we have the altitude, uh, 30, 36, 37 kilometers now, and the velocity, 1.6 kilometers per second. And the speed needed to inject the satellites is? Will be at about uh, 7.6 kilometers per second. Okay. So uh, keep your eyes on the numbers, folks. The boosters are burning now, produced in Samara in Russia. The boosters are the first stage. And you can see they just have Separation been separated, the DDO booster. says it, at uh, 118 seconds, two minutes roughly. That's coming right on time. We're into the uh, second phase of the flight. The second stage is, uh, is burning now. The next milestone coming up will be jettisoning of the fairing. Coming up in about... Uh, Minute, I would say. Yeah, we are now heading to. In fact, we are heading to Europe, uh, northeast, uh, normal. at 54 degrees inclination, and uh, everything is fine on board, and the uh, all the parameters are, are following the curve. The boosters uh, weighed 45 tons each at liftoff, and uh, working with liquid oxygen and kerosene. So we are at about 100 kilometers uh, altitude, and then the fairing will be jettisoned. Fairing provides uh, acoustical and other protections for the payloads inside during liftoff, just like Ariane 5. It also provides the thermal protection of the launcher uh, with respect to the uh, molecular flux of the uh, at, uh, high layers of uh, high density layers of the atmosphere, which we don't have above 100 kilometers, roughly. So yes, we we're almost in vacuum, and then the fairing uh, will be jettisoned. So we don't need it anymore. Weighs uh, weigh measures four meters in diameter roughly 11 meters in length what's it weigh about a ton i imagine about a ton, yes so it's a uh, dead weight which we don't need anymore uh some words on the uh, flight safety uh we have uh safety flight safety uh, uh system which uh, will enables us to uh, verify that the uh, launcher is following its trajectory which you can follow on the curve there and uh, in case of any failure or problem on board, then we would uh, uh, trigger a uh, destruction command so that the, uh, the uh, flight requirements are met and the launcher is, is not uh, able to provoke any casualties. Second stage burning now. Second stage uh, carrying 64 tons of liquid oxygen, 26 tons of kerosene. The propulsion system is a little different than Ariane. Alex will have a word on that uh, in a moment, the second stage produced by DSSKB Progress, like the boosters, prepared in Samara, Samara in Russia. Coming up, about 10 more seconds left in the second stage burn. Normal. Everything normal on board. You can hear the DDO so saying. So we are flying over the Atlantic Ocean, and then uh, all the uh, different stages after separation will fall down into the uh, into the water, into the Atlantic. Into the Atlantic. All right. We also have uh, a naval uh, station. Uh, tracking station on the boat. And there's the separation of the second and third stages. The DDO has called out one particularity of Soyuz, whereas with Ariane, we uh, separate the lower stage before igniting the upper stage. Soyuz does exactly the opposite. The upper stage, third stage, is ignited two seconds before the separation of the lower stage. You can see how that works there. Uh, the upper part of the second stage, which is called the skirt, is used to channel the flux of this motor ignition above 
in the third stage down to the stage below where it rebounds, which gives an added thrust upwards, assisting separation. And then the second stage skirt is then separated about 30 seconds after that. It was still following the flight and the launch parameters and the flight parameters, which are exactly according to We're prediction. right where we should be. Altitude 170, speed four and a quarter kilometers per second. Remember, uh, when we reach uh, roughly seven, we're going to well, let's come back to the launch campaign with Jean-Claude Garot and uh, Didier Dimitri Baranov. This first Soyuz campaign called for an entirely new organization for launcher preparation activities. We needed a two-way cooperation between Russians and Europeans that ensured that each side worked effectively in its own tried and true way, but toward a common goal. Whereas Ariane 5 missions have one launch operations manager, Soyuz has two. The Coel on Soyuz is a little bit like the Ariane. He handles coordination of all operations taking place on the launch side. The big difference for Soyuz is that he is supported by a leader on the Russian side called the Coles and delegates to the Coles the entire coordination of Russian activities. The Russian teams for Soyuz carry out much the same operations here as they do in Baikonur. The Soyuz launcher that we're launching from the French Guyana Space Center is practically identical to the Soyuz we launched from our base in Russia because the ground equipment, which is in direct contact with the launcher, is in fact uh, Russian equipment. The two teams work side by side during the campaign across different cultures and across their varying working methods. Working with the Russian teams is extremely beneficial because uh, we have different approaches, for instance, in the methodology, the working methods. For instance, the Russians have an incredible effectiveness due to their pragmatism. These experienced teams, among the world's finest and responsible for thousands of successful launches over many, many years, nonetheless learn quite a lot from this first Soyuz campaign. The first campaign uh, indicates a number of uh, points that can be further improved, for instance, the linkage between certain operations here, and this will enable us to shorten the timeline for the campaign. It will enable us to improve interaction between the European and Russian teams. Only the experience of the first campaign can give us this. It's impossible to imagine beforehand. We worked, did a good job, didn't we? Yes, we worked well. Not done yet? No, we didn't, but it's good. With these lessons learned, all is now ready for Soyuz's inaugural flight from French Guiana. The third stage uh, continuing to burn. You can see the, uh, with the fairing removed, you see the blue boxes on the right. Those are the two satellites, IOV. The third stage, a little different propulsion system than the two lower stages, right? Yes, it has a more powerful uh, engine and propulsion system. And there are two versions of the uh, third stage engine. The uh, one uh, flying tonight, uh, this morning, sorry, is the uh, RD-124 for the specialists, which is on the uh, this STB version. And there is a less powerful version, uh, RD-110, on the uh, 21A STA version, which will fly in December for the second uh, French Guiana mission uh, of Soyuz. It's coming up in, uh, in the middle of the month, right. Third stage separation coming up in just a few seconds. You'll hear the DDO. We yeah, we got the uh, telemetry signal from the, the boat in, uh, in the middle of the Atlantic, the tracking station, which is embarked abo above uh, on the boat. And so we follow the trajectory of the, uh, of the launcher. There's the extinction of, this, of the third stage and the separation the third stage of the nose has wheel. finished its uh, well, there we task. Are. There's the frigate. The gold, the, the gold bit is the frigate upper stage. Yes, the gold uh, part is the thermal protection of the, uh, of the stage. And uh, this uh, frigate stage is the frigate empty stage, uh, which has uh, four propellant tanks and two uh, spherical uh, cavities for the uh, electronics. It carries the dispenser, the elliptic structure, and the two satellites. 
And this is the most recent version of the frigate with eight uh, small spherical tanks which have been added to and soldered to the four propellant tanks in order to increase the haulage volume and increase the amount of propellant inside the main tanks. That's one of the improvements that were made uh, to frigate for her move here. Yeah, it is, it is manufactured by uh, Lavochkin in Moscow. Mr. Jacques Breton, the uh, senior VP of we'll, we'll uh, sales and uh, marketing customer, and customer service. service. We'll be hearing from uh, Jacques Breton a little later on. We interviewed him uh, CEO of Astrium, uh, François Oak. The frigate is an autonomous, uh, flexible upper stage, designed actually to function as an orbiter. Yeah, it was designed at the, at the beginning as, uh, as a satellite, in fact. As a satellite. More of the, force, the first Soyuz mission in a moment. But for now, the latest news from Ariane Space. We'll be back. September 21st, on her fifth launch this year, Ariane successfully lifted two new telecommunication satellites into orbit, Arabsat 5C and SES-2, nearly nine tons of space hardware. It was the 60th Ariane 5 and the 46th straight success for the European launcher. Ariane Space will launch MEXSAT-3, Mexico's newest telecom satellite, late next year. The three-ton satellite will be delivered on an Ariane 5 or a Soyuz from Europe's spaceport. The 14th APSCC conference on recent evolutions in the satellite market was held at the end of September in Bali. Ariane Space highlighted the advantages of the new range of European launchers operating from French Guiana. Early October in Cape Town was the 62nd International Astronautical Congress, and Jean-Yves Le Gall took the opportunity to confirm Ariane Space's position as world market leader before the space sector's key players attending the conference from around the world. The space base will welcome the first light lift launcher Vega when she arrives in French Vienna October 24th after a sea voyage from Europe. Once in Kourou, the launcher's three-month campaign begins in November for her initial flight, a qualification flight, next January. Vega will be able to lift satellites weighing anywhere from 300 to 2,500 kilos. Eleven minutes left in the first frigate uh, stage burn, 14 minutes uh, in all, roughly. All is well on board. We're coming up next on a film about the building of the launch complex here in French Guiana. Alex, you said you had some of that history first. Yes, in June 2002, the ESA Council decided to implement the Soyuz launch system in French Guiana. The preliminary design studies for Soyuz implementation were conducted jointly by the CNES, Ariane Space, Starsem, the Roscosmos, TSKB, KBOM, and the Lavochkin. And in December 2004, the ESA Council endorsed the finalization of the project funding, and the decision was officially taken to start the Soyuz in French Guiana program. And uh, now more information in the next film on the uh, Soyuz launch pad. The first Herculean task was to clear the jungle and blast out a granite subsoil to build the pad foundations and flame trenches. It took a year to remove nearly a quarter of a million cubic meters of rocks, then used for the concrete foundations of the pad. The key milestones of the project were 2003-2005, the preliminary definition phase with the CNES and the Russian partners when we defined the major choices. Typically we are here in front of the flame trench and it's during the preliminary phase that we decided on the best shape for this flame duct with the Russians. The first Russian teams arrived in July 2008 with hardware for the superstructures, but there was an immediate problem. All the metallic items had to be protected from the corrosion due to the harsh tropical conditions. Meanwhile, a kilometer away, a long preparation hall called the MIC, integration facility in Russian, was being built to assemble the Soyuz stages arriving at the port of Kourou. The program approach had so far replicated as much as possible of the well-proven original Russian launch infrastructures. But there is a major difference with the addition of an 800-ton mobile service gantry. 
Il est clair que le portique a été une décision un peu difficile. The model country clearly was a somewhat difficult decision to make since it was an alteration from the qualified Baikonur environment, though a small one. In Baikonur, service trusses fall away at the last moment, whereas here a mobile gantry moves away. There were several reasons why we made this choice. One was to adapt to French Guiana, namely improve protection against rain and ultraviolet rays. The second reason was to be able to maintain the payload in a constant vertical position, as we always do in Europe. Other key aspects of Soyuz operations at the spaceport a new launcher operations control center in a bunker situated near the assembly building, whilst the mission control is in the famous Jupiter building situated in Kuru some 20 kilometers away. Many of the existing Ariane facilities are being used for Soyuz, such as the satellite preparation clean rooms, but the strategy of keeping distinct launch zones decoupled from each other will give Ariane Space a great flexibility to better serve its clients with either launcher. All is well on board. This is the seventh Soyuz launch pad in the world, actually. There are two in Baikonur. One is uh, for manned missions and one for unmanned. And there are four at Pasetsk. The new facilities are based on the same architecture as the other six pads inherited from the Soviet Union. The pad here has a concrete launch table and a flame pit below, and digging this flame trench, and you saw the flames at liftoff, required a removal, removal of 200,000 cubic meters of rock, which took nearly a year to dig. And during the construction, an inter interesting note, in 2005, some artifacts were found, such as funeral urns, dating back to the first Amerindian settlers from 1200 BC. Coming up now, Mr. Yannick Descata, president of CNES. CNES owns this land and since the 1960s has built the entire space base called the CSG. It also built the Soyuz launch pad for ESA. CNES represents the French state and is responsible for security and coordination for all operations concerning all launches. Today's passengers are the first two satellites for Galileo. Galileo is a major European Union program which will guarantee global navigation positioning services and timing references. Galileo will be a constellation of 30 satellites launched from French Guiana in pairs by Soyuz or in groups of four by Iron 5. NES was at the origins of the conception of the Galileo system. It will ensure that the satellites reach their orbital positions thanks to its Toulouse control center in partnership with ESA. A couple of minutes to go in the first uh, frigate upper stage burn. While we're waiting for the end of the burn, we want to look at some of the Russian industrial partners responsible for, so for Soyuz. First a word on StarSem, created in 1996. Yes, StarSem was created in 1996 with a small operational team who will later join Arian Space, bringing their knowledge and experience of the Soyuz operations. 23 launches have been performed by StarSem, who is now launching in Baikonur with Iran Space for our customers Global Star and Umedsat. And a look at the other Russian industrial partners now responsible for Soyuz, and we'll be back with the end of the first frigate burn. The Soyuz ST launch vehicle has been developed and is being produced at the Samara Space Center, one of the main participants of the Soyuz at Guyana Space Center project. The Soyuz ST carrier has been chosen to implement the project. Launch vehicles of the Soyuz family are descendants of the famous Semyorka, which 50 years ago performed the first manned flight with cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin on board. Carriers of Soyuz family have optimum design, fine-tuned manufacturing technique, 
highly qualified and professional employees, an efficient quality control system applicable to each phase of manufacturing and assembly. The Soyuz ST, produced at the Samara Space Center, is a Soyuz 2 derivative designed for launches from French Guyana. Soyuz 2's stability, maneuverability, highly accurate payload injection and safety maintenance are the reasons why Soyuz 2 has been chosen as a prototype for the Soyuz ST. To perform launches from a new launching site, the Soyuz ST has been modified to meet European safety requirements concerning the telemetry system and operational conditions. New hardware that enables the carrier engines to be cut off from the ground has also been added. In case of emergency, the engines can be cut off manually. And the large size fairing of the ST type, which conforms to international standards, will increase the accommodation area under it. Soyuz ST is delivered from Samara to St. Petersburg in blocks by rail, followed by transportation by sea to French Guyana. Each block is covered and placed into a separate transport container. Some special hermetically sealed containers have been produced to transport the blocks to the equatorial launch site. These containers are to be mounted on platforms on the train and transported 1,500 kilometers to St. Petersburg. And from there, the cargo is taken by sea to French Guyana aboard the ships Calabri and Toucan. Launches from French Guyana will make Soyuz the first carrier in the world that is able to launch from three countries, Kisetsk in Russia, Baikonur in Kazakhstan, and Kourou in Guyana. Just a word on the velocity on the lower left, we're at nine kilometers per second now. We mentioned seven kilometers of speed to inject the satellites. She will, of course, lose velocity between now and satellite separation. Alex, today's launch is a qualification flight for the Soyuz Galileo system, but not, of course, for the launch vehicle itself, right? Yes, the uh, Soyuz launch system ground installations. It includes all the ground infrastructures, gas and fluids, pipes and hoses, telecommunications and electrical network as well as the Russian specific structures and equipment. This has been, uh, this system has been submitted to a complete technical and operational qualification, but the uh, Soyuz rocket itself is a fully qualified launcher. With 1,776 flights in her past. 1,776 flights behind, yes. And today's. We're awaiting word on the frigate burnout. Carrie Valley should be forthcoming with that confirmation. The confirmation has to come pretty far from telemetry, so sometimes there's a delay. There's a signal, uh, the telemetry signal is then sent to uh, here at Osagel in, the, in France, near, Osagel near, station. Near Toulouse, right? In, yeah, in and the then transmitted through the telecommunication networks uh, to Kourou. The frigate we, we mentioned designed uh, to be an orbiter designed in, in, in the 90s actually as a, uh, as, a, as a probe, as a space probe, I think, right? Yes, it has uh, been used by uh, and designed by, Rus by the Russians for uh, space probes that interplanetary missions. It extends the capacity offered by uh, the first three lower stages, so provide, as you say, access to all kinds of orbits, low Earth orbit, the International Space Station, for instance, mid Earth orbit, right, like tonight. And it offers a lot of flexibility to meet these different orbits. And it can uh, be reignited up to 20 times. It's, yeah, the theoretical uh, capability of this stage is 20 reignitions. So can we say that if the first three stages are Russian... De there, he, we, we had a little, a, a little late, but the, like we say, the telemetry com comes in late. But the, uh, the fr frigate stage has been extinguished <laughs> for her first burn, so all is proceeding as planned. So we are flying over Eastern Europe, heading to southwards now to Australia. 
over Russia, Kazakhstan and Indonesia, South Asia, and we shall soon lose the telemetry signal from the launcher. We're going to be hearing from Jean-Yves Legal shortly, Ariane Space's chairman and chief executive, uh, because this marks nearing the end of the first part of the mission for us anyway on the, on the uh, video transmission side. Before we go to Mr. Legal, if we have time, Alex, give us a recap, and if we have to cut you off, we'll come back to you later. But where are we now and where are we going? So we, uh, we, uh, we had a perfect liftoff from Kourou at, uh, on just in time. Donc, yeah. perte normale de la télémesure par la station d'Osaguel, donc trou de télémesure pendant environ 20 minutes. All right, we've had, uh, the DDO has just said normal loss of telemetry signal from Prochaine the Osaguel de télémesure yes, par station. la station de Perth en Australie. Wait for a while, somebody will come. So, so, so we are, we are, um, we're, well, we're waiting for uh, Mr. Legal. We're waiting for Mr. Legal to explain to us uh, why the uh, ground station's <laughs> coverage. Here's Mr. Legal. Uh, making his way to the podium. The next voice you hear will be his. So, as you saw, the first part of this mission went well. The uh, three-stage Soyuz flew perfectly, was followed by the separation of the upper part of the launcher, namely the Frigat stage and the two Galileo satellites. The first uh, firing of Frigat went well. We are presently flying over the Baltic Sea. We will be following, uh, flying over Asia, Indonesia, the Indian Ocean, and a little over three hours while we are above Austra the southern part of Australia. Frigat will be fired a second time, and a little after that, we will have the separation of the satellites. This is what I can uh, say at this stage, and uh, we will see you uh, for the end of the mission later on. Thank you. Okay, Jean Legal summing up. We're, we're going to go now to a film on Franco, the Franco Russian cooperation that brought Soyuz to French Guiana. In 1966, President Charles de Gaulle and Leonid Brezhnev signed protocols that have led to over 40 years of space cooperation, particularly in the domains of science and manned flight. The program to launch Soyuz from French Guiana, agreed in 2004, is also the result of technological constraints, economic and commercial requirements on both sides that can be summed up in one word, complementarity. Europe's Ariane 5 and Soyuz are well-proven and reliable launchers. They have been improved and upgraded over the years but they do not have the same capabilities. Comparatively speaking, Ariane 5 can launch into a GTO, a geostationary transfer orbit, payloads in the order of 10 to 11 tons, accommodating either two satellites in a dual launch or a single, much larger one. Launched from Baikonur, Soyuz is, for the same GTO orbit, less powerful, accustomed to carrying satellites in the 1.7-tonne class. But the European spaceport is situated five degrees north of the equator, where the Earth's rotation is much faster than the 45-degree north latitude at Baikonur. At liftoff from French Guiana, a rocket immediately gets a 500 km an hour velocity advantage. And so launching a Soyuz from French Guiana allows it to orbit between 2.8 and 3 tons into GTO. That's nearly a 50% increase. The European spaceport's geographical position allows the Soyuz, like Ariane 5, to service a wide range of missions, high inclination and polar or sun-synchronous ones, medium-low Earth orbits and GTO, with trajectories over the ocean where rocket stages can fall back safely. The Ariane downrange tracking stations in Brazil, on Ascension Island, in Gabon and Kenya will ensure the precise monitoring of a Soyuz flight. And new stations in Asia, the Pacific Ocean, Canada and mobile ones will be introduced. The Soyuz installation in the tropics has not always been easy, but the rewards are already in sight. 
This inaugural flight is the first of a series of launch contracts. The French space agency's Pleiad Earth observation satellites, the second Galileo IOVs and subsequent pairs of spacecraft, ESA's Gaia astronomy mission and weather satellites for UMITSAT, to name but a few. Operating both launchers, plus the soon-to-be-introduced European-developed small launcher called Vega, Europe will be able to orbit any type of satellite and allow Ariane space to capture new sectors of the space transportation market. The downrange tracking stations are designed to always follow the launcher's trajectory, keeping her in view. However, we had a loss of telemetry happen just before the film. Yeah, we lost the telemetry signal from the launcher since we do not have enough ground stations in the world to remain in visibility of the whole trajectory. But we are now in a purely ballistic phase without propulsion. The frigate and the satellites constitute a passive body, the motion of which is entirely determined by the uh, Keplerian laws, the uh, celestial mechanics, and the we therefore we can therefore predict with a great accuracy when we shall recover the telemetry signal by the Australian stations of Tongara and Perth and where the uh, frigate is on its trajectory. So we don't have telemetry, but it doesn't matter because we know where we are. We know where Basically. we are and we'll have no more perturbations. Okay, an interview now with Maria Jasinski, one of the senior project managers of the Soyuz in French Guiana project. The project started in 2004 with initial earthworks near the town of Sinemarie in Guyana. In January 2005, we started the earthworks at the site itself. In December 2005, we selected the European industries that would be building the infrastructure. 2006 to 2007, they, this was the entire phase where we built the buildings and facilities, but they were empty. Parallel to this, the Russian supplies were designed and developed in Russia. 2008-2009 is the period when we equipped the buildings and facilities and the Russian side brought in the first equipment to the site in August 2008. 2009, end of 2009 to March 2011, we assembled and tested the mobile gantry and qualified the entire system, the technical uh, qualification of the systems. April 2011 to Ju June 2011, we had the uh, operational qualification done by Ariane. This is the sixth launch of the year that you're watching for Ariane Space, the first of two Soyuz, which we already mentioned. There's a second scheduled for mid-December. The next Ariane 5 flies early next year with a third ATV, Eduardo Amaldi, the first Vega, also in early 2012, a very, very busy period. Yes. We hope you're enjoying it. There's lots more to come, so don't go away. And the, uh, Mr. Joel Barr, director of the CNES uh, CSG. For the Guyana Space Center, the first Soyuz launch in French Guyana is, firstly, the culmination of all the work we've carried out in recent years to be able to launch Soyuz here. We had to adapt our preparation facilities for the upper parts of the payloads, our interfaces, and our means of measurement to the Soyuz launcher's characteristics. All this was done. It was tested during the launch qualification period and was the result of all the work performed by our teams over these past years. The second point is that the arrival of Soyuz here in French Guiana continues the ongoing ramp-up of activities here at the base. Growth of the CSG's activities has been increasing over the past five years. With Soyuz and Vega, we will have more launches to the northeast, like today's, with the launch of the first two Galileo satellites. Launches to the north mean measuring devices and in particular more varied telemetry stations downrange anywhere in the world. For this flight we have a telemetry station on board a ship in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. 
The third element is continuation of what I call the internationalization of the base. We're Europe's spaceport, operating as part of the European Space Agency. With the Russian teams, who have been here for three years now, since 2008, we have increased the international dimension. This allows for exchanges and for comparing of different practices and techniques among the cultures. I think it's a real process of dialogue and collaboration among the teams, those of our Russian friends, the European teams on site, and the Kness teams here at the CSG. Such exchanges are very fruitful for everyone. Tout ça, ce sont des échanges qui sont évidemment très enrichissants et très fructueux pour pour tout le monde. Alex, you, you've been in Baikonur, I think. What do you see as the similarities and the differences between Baikonur and here? Well, in Baikonur, apart from the weather conditions, the uh, satellite operations are almost identical to those performed in Kourou. The Baikonur Launch Center is at first, or oh, first of all, the place where a major part of the human space history began. Today, Star Seven and Ariane Space are conducting satellite standalone operations in state, inside state-of-the-art preparation halls specifically, de specifically designed and built for this purpose. The outside environment is, of course, very different. But uh, let's learn more about the Soyuz missions uh, with uh, François Barrault. The Soyuz launcher and some of the facilities here at the space base where she is prepared for her missions have been adapted to meet certain local technical specifications. These modifications will let the Russian launcher carry out many different types of missions. The different missions that are accessible uh, with Soyuz from Guyana are comparable to what we do with Ariane 5. The geographical position of the launch center means we can launch toward the east and the north and sweep all the azimuths between these two main points. The Galileo mission that we are in now is going to be launched at a 54 degree azimuth, i.e. halfway between north and east, but we will also be able to do missions toward the north, particularly the number two mission, which will be launched on 16 December. This is an SSO a launch for CNES with the Pleiades a satellite, a small secondary satellite, uh, ELISA, and a very small Chilean observation satellite called SSOT. From Guyana, we will also be doing scientific missions such as Gaia and also the launch of a number of constellation satellites, uh, particularly the O3B uh, constellation launched on an equatorial orbit. The advantage of the Soyuz is essentially linked to the Forgot stage, which is under the fairing. This is a stage which we developed with NPO Lavachkina. We have upgraded it several times, and its advantage is that it can be reboosted, uh, fired several times in flight, which means that we can achieve a very large number of different orbits. Uh, we can do complex missions with two, three, five uh, boosts uh, and firings of this stage, which means that we can have six payloads. And this, by the way, is going to be the case on 16 uh, December. Some other differences between Baikonur and here, just to continue, launches to the east get a natural energy boost from the equator where the CSG is. It's one reason uh, Soyuz moved here. Baikonur lies at 45 degrees north, Kourou is at 5 degrees north. At uh, Baikonur's latitude, the Earth's rotation rate is much slower, which brings a performance penalty, they call it, particularly for GTO launches, geostationary transfer orbit. Also from Baikonur, the Soyuz lower stages must fall on land, not at sea, like uh, with the French Guiana base, which limits choice of orbits. That's another reason the site, the, the Kourou site was selected, the French Guiana site was selected. We can launch out uh, over the ocean. Up next, another interview, this time Louis Laurent of Ariane Space on the changing organization inside the launch teams. Generally speaking, uh, the way we organize operations for Soyuz in Guyana is comparable with what we do with Ariane and have been doing for the past years, many years. Ariane Espace, of course, is in charge of commercializing these launch services. And in the area of operational activities, we uh, have our main three jobs. The first thing we do is preparing missions. This means essentially to check performances, calculate uh, 
trajectories. This is something we do with our Russian partners. The second task is supplying the launchers, and the third is what we do here, i.e. operational activities. These include uh, the following. First of all, we coordinate generally all of the campaign activities, specifically coordination of activities on the uh, launch uh, based by CSG teams and prepara satellite preparation teams. After this, we share the uh, divide activity up between European systems developed by European companies, implemented by European companies, on the one hand, and the Russian systems developed in Russian, identically to what uh, is used in uh, Russian launch centers that have been installed here, tested by Russian teams, the whole uh, point being to coordinate all of this activity between the different partners involved. Of course, there are difficulties, language, the culture, habits, but overcome thanks to the experience acquired during the 23 launches from Baikonur. Uh, also has been acquired as a project uh, developed. The great challenge of Soyuz in the CSG is not to Europeanize a Soyuz system or create a Russian system in a European bubble, but to develop a model of original cooperation based on cooperation and the best of both systems. There's so much to say about Soyuz. Going back to Gagarin's flight, which occurred actually 50 years ago this year, that flight was totally automatic. All the controls on board the capsule were blocked. The designer, Sergei Korolev, unable to sleep the night before uh, the mission. He felt it had a 50-50 chance of success and reportedly had to swallow a handful of tranquilizers a few moments before liftoff. Gagarin himself slept perfectly, awoke at 5.30, had breakfast, and did not shave, following a tradition of Soviet pilots. At liftoff, however, his pulse rate jumped from 64 to 157 beats a minute. Coming next... Patrick Loire, director of Iron Space Crew, about the activity of the launch base. The addition of two new launchers, Soyuz and Vega, to the Ariane family has meant a considerable reorganization here at the space base. Until now, most activities have centered pretty much around Ariane 5. The simultaneous use of the different launch system is founded on the principle of synergy. This synergy is provided by the operational teams, and we developed it with CNES and our industrial partners here at the base. In addition, we had to integrate the Russian side. The Russian teams boosted the teams already here in carrying out the launch campaign. On the side today, we have 350 Russian with us. The Russian teams helped build the Soyuz launch pad and carry out this first campaign. This collaboration will allow Ariane Space to better organize future campaigns for its launch family. The future will see development of the range of launch vehicles uh, with the preparation of the second Soyuz already underway. In parallel, we are also preparing the Vega qualification flight, then the ATV-3, which will be the first Ariane mission next year. Ariane Space's skilled operational teams will be able to work on three different launcher systems. Being adaptable will ensure the same high-quality standards for all three programs. The use of three launch systems will enable a CSG to reach a new dimension, since we will go from six Ariane launches to ten launches with Ariane, Soyuz and Vega. The challenge will be to perform all operations perfectly and to make sure that any overlap of activities creates no interference between the different launch systems. Alex, what are the possibilities eventually of manned missions from French Guiana? Well, uh, I, I would say that we might be able to one day to fly manned missions from Kourou. This subject has been brought up to the attention of all decision makers when the Soyuz in French Guiana works were discussed. It would technically mean some adaptations of the ground installations, but there is theoretically no impossibility to send astronauts to the International Space Station from French Guiana. Because we have the launcher. We have the launcher. So it's, it's the same launcher. So uh, m with some adaptations. On the ground And side. of course, a big political uh, decision at the highest level, we might be able to do that. So it's under review, would you say? Too early to say? Too early to it's a bit early to say this, but uh, we'll hear more in the coming years. 
We're going to hear more in our next film. You'll hear, among others, from Antonio Fabrizi, ISIS director of launchers all about Galileo. It is, a, it is a big step. It's a political step, of course. It's a sign of a collaboration. It's also a challenge. It's a big challenge. I mean, uh, up to now, in the last uh, uh, 20, 30 years, we have been uh, operating one launcher at the time for French Guiana. Now, we suddenly, in one step, we go to operate three launchers. Actually, if we look at what is happening in this uh, uh, last phase of 2011, we have a sequence of launches which is uh, quite interesting. In September, one RM5 ECA, then we have two Soyuz, then we have uh, we, in two different versions, then we have uh, uh, Vega, and then we have another version of Ariane 5 for ATV that will be end of February. So you see, in uh, less than six months, uh, we have uh, five different versions of launchers, uh, which is uh, quite demanding for all the teams that operate in French Guiana, the industrial teams, uh, the CNES, and the Ariane Space teams. So this is quite new for Europe and is uh, an important challenge. During the launcher campaign, everyone in French Guiana and throughout Europe has been conscious that this is a historic mission. It is a landmark in space cooperation, the conjunction of a legendary Russian launcher with the operational expertise of the European spaceport. The payload is also of paramount importance, opening the road to Europe's very own satellite navigation system. The in-orbit validation phase satellites aboard the Soyuz have been manufactured by a consortium including EADS Astrium and Thales Alenia Space. With another pair to be lofted next year, they will confirm the performance of the Galileo system and form the nucleus of the constellation expected to be fully operational with 30 satellites. Since 2005, the experimental Jove A and Jove B craft have been testing critical components of the system, such as the ultra-precise atomic clocks. To compute its position by triangulation, a satellite navigation receiver needs to register the signals of four satellites, whose timing signals must be rigorously in step. The Galileo clocks will be accurate to one second in three million years. Galileo also represents a big step for Europe. For the first time, EU member states are funding a major space program defined and developed by the European Space Agency. The European Space Agency has primarily a technical role. We are uh, designing the system, procuring the various system components, satellites, ground segment, integrating and validating the whole system and making sure it works uh, for the benefit of all users in Europe. Europe's EGNOS system, which uses a network of geostationary satellites and ground stations to enhance American GPS signals, has already demonstrated many of the Galileo future services. On the roads, for maritime or air transport, in fact for anything that moves on Earth, Galileo will bring real-time positioning to within a metre, allowing better management, saving fuel and increasing safety. The two satellites of the Soyuz maiden flight from French Guiana are indeed true heralds of a new space constellation. And in coming years, the term Galileo will be a household reference for hundreds of millions of users across Europe and around the world. We're going to be with you for just another two minutes and then we'll cut away and be back in about three hours with the rest of the mission. But before that, two things, Alex. One, we have had confirmation, I think, or we're coming up on confirmation of the end of the telemetry loss. Yes, we heard the uh, director of operations uh, telling us that the telemetry has been recovered. So the PERS, the Australian station, has recovered the telemetry signal from the, uh, the frigate stage. And then we have recovered the indications of altitude and velocity on, on the uh, bottom left of the screen. Okay, now, and, and that's the, uh, the last thing I wanted to ask you. The, the velocity, we're now at it's a little better than six kilometers per second. We were as high as nine. Can yes, you just explain how that fluctuates? Because we are cruising on the elliptical orbit, and uh, the more you uh, get close to the apogee, this is the most uh, 
well, farthest from the uh, from the uh, focus from the Earth. The, high, the highest point does that mean? The highest High point, point so the closer than the the smaller the velocity and the closer to the uh, to the Earth, the uh, higher the velocity. So we are cruising on the, the so the velocity is is changing all the time when you cruise on elliptical orbit. And we'll have our other word. Okay, some shots of the replay, fabulous shots that you saw 50 minutes ago. Reliving those exciting emotional moments. I'm gonna see if Alex is gonna cry again. As he was, I, his eyes were oh, tearing with joy. <laughs> so he is lifting off flawlessly, beautifully, from her new home here in French Guiana. Boom, see that ignition. There you go. There she goes. Making space history again. Fine shots for everybody here in person on the beaches or in the observation posts around the base, watching their cars parked along the road, all taking place in the historic space first, as you did with us. We're very pleased. With those shots, we'll leave you temporarily. The first mar part of the, uh, the mission for us is over. We'll be back in about three hours, 10.38 roughly local time, 3.30 in the afternoon Europe. We'll see you then. Joshua Jample and Alex Medembasi. Goodbye, see you. Greetings and welcome back to this historic first launch of Soyuz in French Guiana, part two. Joshua Jample with Alex Mademba C with you for this second and final part of the broadcast. Another replay coming up first with some new shots, helicopter shots, and while uh, you're watching that, we'll be preparing the way to be seeing the second frigate upper stage burn and followed by the separation of the two satellites, of course, all that and more in the next... Uh, Here's your replay. That very emotional moment when the gantry moved, moved back. I think that moved everyone. And we're ready to go. That's at minus uh, 30 seconds. And the two last disconnections from the watch. And the other disconnection. From the last ignition sequence. So 20 engines. The engines first being, and being second tested. stages. Being tested on, on the ground. And finally moving. A lot of cameras up there. There's the big maiden flight for full throttle. AOV. Galileo. And the rain cloud came by, but as the uh, the Russians said earlier, rain brings luck, so they were happy to see that. And the fireball moving up into the sky over French Guiana. So we'll have separation of the satellites, as I was saying. All that in the next 50, 50 minutes roughly. Lots of action, lots of films and interviews. You don't want to miss it. Alex, can you give us a recap of uh, what's been happening for the last three hours? Where were we? Where are we? And where, where are we going? What's going to happen? Yeah, sure. So after liftoff, the uh, Soyuz carrying the two Galileo satellites began its cruise over the Atlantic, thanks to the thrust of its powerful first, second and third stage. The, all the stages and the fairing were well separated according to the flight timeline and released, releasing the nose module, the frigate's upper stage carrying the two satellites. Then the frigate stage performed the first boost of 13 minutes to place the uh, nose module onto an elliptical transfer orbit at a velocity of about 6 kilometers per second. It then uh, followed uh, this ellipt elliptic path, which is still the case now, without propulsion as a purely ballistic body during 3 hours 20 minutes. All right, our next film coming up more on the two satellites. We'll be back with the recap and more of what's ahead. Galileo will eventually have a 30-strong constellation of spacecraft, but for the initial IOV, the in-orbit validation phase, four satellites are required. Two experimental craft, GOV-A and GOV-B, were launched respectively in December 2005 and April 2008. While securing the required frequencies, they have since been characterizing the environment of the medium Earth orbit at 23,000 kilometers and testing the critical components such as the atomic clocks and the navigation antenna.
Approaching six years in orbit, Jove A, with a rubidium clock, is still working exceptionally well, reflecting the operating margins built into the spacecraft design. In parallel, Jovi B is giving teams great satisfaction. The passive hydrogen maser at its heart is still ticking away, the most precise atomic clock ever flown in space for navigation. The Jove satellites have also been testing the ranging capabilities of the telemetry and telecommand stations, thus contributing to the qualification of the Galileo ground segment. The first two operational satellites in this IOV phase are those entrusted today to the Soyuz, and two more satellites will be orbited next year. It is a key moment for the program. These satellites are really operational satellites. They will be able to perform the operational task of a Galileo, I mean receiving um, a signal from the ground segment and retransmitting in an end-to-end -end approach that really provide um, a real navigation signal for users. Today's satellites and the next pair were designed by EADS Astrium and assembled in Rome by Teles Alenia Space. Each weighs in at some 700 kilograms and will span 14 meters with its solar panels deployed. The in-orbit validation phase will open the road to the full deployment capacity of the Galileo system, passing from theory to practice, so as to offer positioning services in Europe and beyond, and ensuring that Europe masters this promising field of satellite navigation. All right, finish up uh, the recap, and then I, I want to ask you about uh, the final uh, yes, Galileo so phase. Yes, so Fregat and the two satellites are on their elliptic path, elliptic trajectory, and uh, they will be in uh, some time, a second boost, over three minutes, to place the uh, two satellites and Fregat on the final circular orbit at 23,000 kilometers and a velocity of about 7.6 kilometers per second. Okay, all that's ahead. Hope you'll stay with us. Even farther ahead, Alex, you're a program director for Galileo's what they call the FOC phase. I'll ask you about that after this film, because we're going to see uh, Antonio Tajani, the EC VP for Galileo and Space Activities. This is first and foremost the launch of a cluster of satellites which will lead to the full implementation of the Galileo program. I would like to thank all the experts who contributed to the success of this event, the people from the European Commission, the European Space Agency, the European Member States, all the European institutions, the GNSS European Agency, and all the companies involved in this effort. They have all turned what was only a dream into a reality. I am committed to achieving two objectives. First, speed up the implementation of Galileo. We have a great deal of time to catch up. We have to work faster. Second, we have to cut costs. I have decided to buy additional satellites within the shortest possible deadline in order to speed up the implementation of the full infrastructure. This would enable us to quickly implement the entire system. By 2020, a complete constellation of almost 30 satellites will provide and deliver a public service worldwide through high-quality satellite navigation system. We are going to meet this target because I have strong faith in the know-how developed in Europe for this new technology. I would like to draw the attention of small and medium-sized European enterprises to the exceptional opportunities Galileo provides. Seize these opportunities. Be innovative. The Commission took an important step when it decided to allocate the sum of 1 billion euros each year for seven years to the European navigation programs between 2014 and 2020. The challenges the program are global and the potential gains are tremendous. We mustn't look to the sky alone, however, we must also stay down to earth so as to draw out the full potential of Galileo. Right, you are final, uh, you're program director for the FOC phase for Galileo. Now tell us what that is. Yes, FOC means full operational capability for the constellation. The first launch is scheduled in December 2012, early 2013. And the first 10 OHB satellites uh, will be launched by pairs on five Soyuz STB launchers, including the same dispenser as the one used today for IOV. For the rest of the constellation, the launchers will be split between Ariane 5, four satellites at a time, with an Astrium dispenser or Soyuz STB. But you certainly want to know more about Galileo. How does it work?
The payloads of the IOV satellites have much the same design as those tested with the Jovi satellites, with advanced technology systems such as the atomic clocks and the navigation antenna. For a satellite navigation system to work, a receiver on Earth needs to simultaneously receive the signals of four satellites. They circled the Earth at 23,000 kilometers in three orbital planes. The receiver computes its own position by calculating the difference in the received signals from the satellites that will be in its visibility. But the Galileo system is, in fact, one vast space clock. The signals broadcast by the spacecraft must be rigorously synchronous, timed by identical clocks. Each spacecraft has four atomic clocks. They work like conventional ones, but their time base, instead of an oscillating mass as in a pendulum clock, use the movement of atoms, their property to switch rapidly between different states of energy. It is the frequency of this transition that is fed into a counter. Each IOV spacecraft has two types of clocks. The so-called passive hydrogen maser is the most precise clock ever placed in orbit for navigation, accurate to one second in three million years. Its backup is a rubidium clock, accurate to three seconds in a million years. The master clock's timing precision is critical to achieve the accuracy of the Galileo service. An error of a single nanosecond, that is one billionth of a second, implies a ranging error on the ground of 30 centimeters. If translated to a second, this represents an error of 300,000 kilometers. Instead of being in one's car on the way home, one might as well be on the moon. To achieve this extreme time stability, the satellite's operating conditions and its environment are also paramount. So the satellites have been designed to maintain constant operating conditions. Temperature variation is limited to one-tenth of a degree, which is a remarkable feat, considering that the spacecraft pass regularly from sunlight plus 100 degrees Celsius to shadow minus 150. The Galileo system must also take into account the space environment, such as radiation level, that changes along the orbits that the satellites follow, with resulting slight variations in the propagation time of their signals. Finally, there is the ground segment, the tracking stations around the world and the two control centers in Germany and Italy must equally beat like metronomes, rigorously in step with the satellites, capable of predicting their precise position and timely contacting them to upload freshly computed navigation correction instructions. It is the combination of all these elements that will allow Galileo to provide precise and guaranteed positioning services. The, uh, there's an amusing story on the 1975 Soyuz Apollo mission. We are talking about the Gagarin flight earlier. Apparently 10 days before that mission, Alexei Leonov, who was the Soyuz commander, promised Deke Slayton, who was the Apollo capsule pilot, that they'd share a drink during the flight. And when the hatch doors opened and they got together, Leonov brought out tubes labeled vodka. Now, the Americans declined these, uh, the generous offer because of a NASA ruling that banned uh, alcohol, but they ended up drinking only to find that it was actually soup. Next film. Applications. Of Galileo is on its way, but satellite navigation in Europe is already a reality, thanks to EGNOS. By using three geostationary satellites and a vast network of ground stations, EGNOS sharpens and secures the accuracy of American GPS signals across Europe with a precision down to the meter. EGNOS is demonstrating future uses of Galileo. Already in the field of aviation, pilots have, with EGNOS, extremely precise indications of their position in real time, invaluable when preparing to land. A precision approach made with the help of the satellite increases air security, especially for airports which are operating non-precise guidance approach systems. 
These new systems will benefit general aviation and business aviation as well, and safe airports will increase the development of the regions where they are located. Advantages on Europe's roads will cover much more than in-car navigation. Road haulage companies and bus operators will be better able to manage their fleets of lorries or coaches, optimizing movements, avoiding congestion and saving fuel. Galileo will introduce new ways of monitoring tachychronograph systems, thus increasing safety and also tracking stolen vehicles. Likewise, Galileo will assist maritime transport. With an estimated 50,000 ships around the world, it can contribute to safer and more precise navigation. Complementing and improving the existing COSPAS SARSAT system, its search and rescue service will detect activated distress beacons, notifying the appropriate rescue services and letting the users know that help is coming. Agriculture will benefit in the field of precision farming. 60% of satellite-guided tractors are already using EGNOS, reducing driver fatigue, allowing ultra-precise tillage or distribution of fertilizers and herbicides, and livestock can be monitored at a distance. Various categories of citizens will be able to use individual handsets or mobile phones that incorporate Galileo chips guiding tourists in an unknown city, providing real-time information on local public transport, or helping the blind or poorly sighted and assisting the disabled. Even if Galileo will be the first civilian global navigation system in the world, the use of certain so-called public regulated services will be restricted to authorized users such as governments for sensitive applications that require a high degree of continuity and reliability. The uh, Soyuz can deliver satellites in three different orbits, I think we've been talking about that. The first is a sun-synchronous orbit where the satellite circles the Earth passing over the poles, sort of like a ball of yarn effect. Uh, many space probes do that, but there are two other orbits that she can do. What are they? Uh, the GTO, the geostationary orbit, is an equatorial circular orbit of 36,000 kilometers above the Earth's surface. And this is the case for the uh, majority of the telecommunication satellites, which might appear motionless at a fixed posi position on the Earth. We'll come back on that after this Galileo ground segment film. After the launch of the second pair next year, the mini constellation of four satellites in space will be an early implementation of the final system, eventually with 30 satellites. Associated with the deployment of an initial ground infrastructure, they will be able to check for the first time in the field the design of the system. The baseline for the Galileo ground segment for this IOV phase is to use two control centers, two telemetry tracking and control stations, five uplink stations and eight so-called Galileo sensor stations. The control center in charge of the ground control segment will be located in Oberpfaffenhofen, Germany. It will provide the monitoring and control functions for the constellation of the Galileo operational satellites. The second control center in charge of the ground mission segment is located in Fucino, Italy. It will provide the overall navigation functions of the system, the orbit determination, the time synchronization and the generation of navigation messages to users. ESA station in Rodou, Belgium, already used for the GeoVe satellites, will now be hosting a dedicated Galileo in-orbit testing station. Telemetry, tracking and control stations have been installed in Kiruna, Sweden, in Kourou, French Guiana, and uplink stations at Svalbard in Norway, in Kourou, on Reunion Island and in New Caledonia. Finally, eight sensor stations collecting data broadcast by the Galileo satellites for further processing in Fucino are deployed all around the globe.
And uh, there's another orbit that you were telling us about. Go ahead. The medium Earth orbit, the uh, orbit followed by Galileo, it's uh, orbit within the range uh, from a few hundred miles to a few thousand miles above the Earth's surface. Typically for navigation satellites, like called the uh, Galileo system, GLONASS for GPS, and the low Earth orbit, LEO, which is uh, generally defined as an orbit within the uh, focus extends, extending from the Earth's surface up to an altitude of about 2,000 kilometers. An interview now with Evar Judok, chairman of Astrium Satellites, builders of the IOV satellites. We are all here to witness today a historic moment. It's the start of the first two uh, Galileo satellites. Uh, it's basically the start of Galileo for Europe. Europe definitely needs Galileo with this uh, satellite navigation, that uh, system that, uh, that will change the world. We know that it is very, very important for logistics, it is very important for security, and it will boost economics in the future. Thanks to uh, the EU for really uh, taking this investment onto their account and starting these activities a long time ago, it uh, it will make a difference for all of us, for all the people in, in Europe for sure. Today, Galileo will become a reality. It is, uh, of course, very, very special. It's the first two satellites that will start. It's the first two satellites built by Astrium, with the European team behind. But of course, also the first launch on a Soyuz rocket from Kourou is a very special event. Astrium is, of course, very, very proud to be uh, in Galileo, and, and uh, we have been in the Galileo system from the start. Also me personally, I've been following the project very, very closely, so I'm very glad to be here. We have uh, an involvement in the system activities and the ground control activities, but of course today we talk about the first two satellites, which are, let's say, finishing the development of the Galileo satellites. And uh, they, those development activities, the qualifications of all the equipment on board, are building the basis for all the future Galileo satellites. So every satellite to be built and to be launched in the coming months and years will be kind of copies from the system we are starting today. So with that, having that said, I uh, look forward to a good start and a good start of Galileo for Europe. Thank you for your attention. Alex, this part of the mission before the final frigate upper stage burn is also called the barbecue phase. Why yes. is it called barbecue? So frigate and the satellites on top slowly turns around its longitudinal axis to minimize the heating effect due to the sun radiations on the satellites and on the frigate state surfaces. This phase is called, this is why this phase is called the barbecue phase. Uh, you may think of a chicken on a rotisserie. Turning around on the spit, okay. <laughs> under the sun. And next to come is an interview with Renal Sesnek of Thales Salinia Space. There are four major satellite constellations under construction in the world today. Galileo is one of them, and being an asset for Europe, it is the most important. Thales Alenia Space is pleased to play a major role in all four. After all, we first became involved in the European satellite navigation system, Galileo, almost 15 years ago. At that time, we were drafting the early concepts of an independent satellite navigation system for Europe. A lot has happened since, and Thales Alenia Space has contributed to every stage. We started with EGNOS, the European Safety of Life mission segment. Then, we developed the Galileo ground mission segment. The first part of live operation is starting now. The development of quite a few equipments, the system support, the integration of the satellite have also kept us busy. I would like to extend my warmest thanks to the European Commission, to ESA, and to all our industrial partners for their continued confidence in us. A lot remains to be done, but Galileo is now reality in space. It has been an extremely difficult industrial challenge. And I would like to underline all the efforts done by the teams of Astrium, Thales Alenia Space, and our customer, and to thank them warmly for this achievement. This launch being also the first of Soyuz from French Guiana, I wish to congratulate Ariane Espace and our Russian colleagues 
for this success. Alex, the orbits that you were talking about just a moment ago bring greater flexibility to Ariane space, which is, of course, good news for the customers. Yes, we'll, uh, with Vega, uh, by early next year, we'll have the possibility to technically address uh, all types of orbits, including uh, escape orbits for interplanetary mission that we did for the Rosetta mission, the ESA Rosetta mission, for instance. And this is indeed a big, big asset for Ariane space and its customers. For more on the commercial side, we go to Jacques Breton now, Ariane Space's Senior VP for Sales Marketing and Customer Service. Having a full range of launch vehicles is a big commercial advantage. It lets Ariane Space offer its customers service and solutions for any mass, any orbit, at any time. Soyuz uh, perfectly uh, complement the Ariane Space family of launch vehicles. Together with Ariane 5, our workhorse for the launches of commercial satellites into uh, GTO, and uh, with the uh, soon-to-be-launched Vega for uh, light missions, uh, mainly for uh, scientific uh, programs. Soyuz is uh, very well adapted to the deployment of constellations, as uh, Galileo, a multiple launch. Multiple launch is finally the, the specialty of uh, Ariane Space. We perform regularly dual launches with uh, Ariane 5. Uh, Soyuz is very well adapted to the launch of satellites for scientific missions, for uh, Earth observation, remote sensing. With our family of launch vehicles, we can now address any segment of the market. And in addition, we have within this family uh, backup capabilities. For instance, the Soyuz can launch the small uh, satellite of a, a dual launch on Ariane, the Freeton uh, class satellites. So if we have an excess of small satellites to be launched on Ariane, they can be launched on Soyuz as a dedicated launch. For instance, also uh, for sun synchronous mission of observation satellites, these satellites can be launched either on Vega as a dedicated launch or on Soyuz as a dual launch. Therefore, we uh, increase the flexibility of our offer and the added value for the customer. Today, we can say that Soyuz is meeting the market's needs. We have already signed contracts for 17 dedicated uh, launches and uh, we have also in our order book 12 GTO satellites that have the dual compatibility Soyuz and uh, Ariane. So we can say that today uh, Soyuz is a commercial success and it has now to become a launch success and that's why we are here today. So opening up a whole new commercial arena. For Ariane Space customers, uh, there will be no difference in terms of interface between the customer and Ariane Space team. For Ariane, Soyuz or Vega, all throughout the mission integration process, the, uh, all the studies and all the activities aimed at checking that the satellite is compatible with the launcher environment will be conducted, coordinated and performed according to the same standards. Coming up on the second frigate burn, which is due in about, I would say, 10 seconds. But with the telemetry delay, we might uh, have a few seconds uh, to wait. The second frigate burn will be a shorter one than uh, the first one. That's the necessary energy to uh, switch from the elliptical orbit to the normal circular one. The GTO tells us that everything is normal on board. What will the second burn do? It will uh, give the uh, amount of velocity and uh, the additional velocity and also the orientation of this velocity. And there we have it. Right on time. That's good news. We, we got the ignition. See what that looks like up there. That's the frigate, the gold bit, and the blue, the two blue boxes so it gives are the two satellites. What we call the velocity increment to switch from elliptical to a circular orbit, final orbit. And uh, for this mission, almost all of the uh, propellant uh, will have been used after this uh, second burn of the frigate. So we'll use uh, almost all the capacity of the, uh, of the propellant. And after the satellites have been separated, the frigate will use uh, a second uh, smaller system which uses hydrazine and thrusters uh, to change its orientation 
and move away 300, 400 kilometers away f uh, above the Galileo orbit. Frigate was designed in the 90s, I think we mentioned that, to be a space probe and function as a self-contained uh, orbiter. There are differences, however, in the, the different uh, versions of the upper stage, aren't there? So this is the uh, empty version of Fregat, uh, which uh, initially has uh, the same initial design with, with the four propellant tanks and two uh, additional spherical capacities where the uh, electronics and the, and the brain of the, of the stage is located. And the computers. And uh, the yes, the onboard computer. And uh, on each of the propellant tanks, they can see two uh, additional uh, smaller spherical capacities. Can we see the propeller tanks there on, on the screen? Yes, uh, uh, just beneath the, uh, the spherical, uh, small to uh, white uh, spherical uh, capacities. There are the propellant tanks. The four, two for the UDMH, the uh, unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine, and two for the N204, the nitrogen tetroxide which are chemical uh, products, which are hypergolic, which means that there is no energy needed to, uh, to uh, provoke the combustion of the, two, uh, of the two liquids when they enter into contact in the combustion chamber. You saw in the animation we're flying over Perth, over Australia. As uh, has been mentioned, we'll be over the Indian Ocean south of Australia when we separate the satellites in just about seven minutes coming up. Now, this this frigate stage, you said, can uh, we're burning twice, reigniting it uh, one time, uh, burning twice and all, but uh, it can be reignited up to 20 times, you said. Yes, the design uh, is uh, such that uh, the frigate stage is theoretically able to uh, be reignited 20 times. Uh, this, of course, is, uh, is design has been made for uh, multiple uh, orbits, uh, and uh, offers uh, great flexibility for uh, different types of missions. Uh, the next mission, which will be performed in December here in Kourou with the Pleiad uh, satellites and uh, other... That's Earth observation satellites. Yeah. Uh, yes, Pleiad is Earth observation satellite, carrying also uh, four other satellites, like ELISA and SSOT, a uh, small Chilean uh, Satellite auxiliary payloads. Auxiliary payload, uh, much smaller. Uh, we'll have uh, five uh, reignitions. So five ignitions of the frigate stage for this mission, uh, for to reach the different orbits which are required by each of the satellites. All right, coming up on the end of the second frigate burn. It's not a long one. The first one, 14 minutes. This one, roughly about four minutes. The upper stage of the Ariane 5 is also reignitable. Yeah, the upper stage of uh, the Ariane 5 ES version, which is used for the ATV, is also uses two hypergolic uh, propellants, which are much, pretty much similar to the ones that are used by Fregat, the N204, the same, and the uh, um, MMH, monomethyl hydrazine. Extinction de l'étage Fregat. There is the end of the second stage. Right on burn. time. Coming right on time. You so see the nozzle I'll shutting down. Finish there. with my explanation. <laughs> and this uh, this uh, stage is capable of reignition. So what the DDO says is we're orienting the yes. composite in its other direction to separate the satellites. Yes, so that the satellites can be separated uh, with their velocity exactly uh, parallel to the uh, to the orbit. Now, one part of the launcher that we haven't talked about is the dispenser. What's that? This uh, adapting structure is made uh, mainly of aluminum, and it is made by RUAG, the Swiss uh, company, uh, formerly uh, known as uh, Saab Aerospace. And uh, this structure is the same that will be used for the uh, FOC satellites uh, for the follow-up uh, launches. And uh, once the satellites are separated, that's coming up in just about four minutes, how are they separated? Are they, they're, they're pushed away from, from the mothership. Yes, there are four separation devices composed uh, each of two main mechanisms which are screwed on brackets at each of the four corners of the satellite. Okay, our final film coming up on what will happen to the IOV satellites once they're separated. Don't go away, we're going to have separation afterward. The launch and early operations phase of the satellites begins as they separate from the launcher. It ends when the satellites are placed in their final orbit. The operations are divided into three phases. 
The first one, the initialization, lasts two hours. It will enable the operational team of CNES and ISOC to unfold the solar panels and initiate the sun pointing in order to get the necessary power for the spacecrafts. The second phase lasts 18 hours. It concerns aligning with and tracking the sun, then checking to see that all the systems are working well, and finally, orientating the satellites towards the Earth. During all of this phase, their exact position is calculated using measurements made by ground stations. During the third phase, a series of maneuvers take place, one every 12 hours, alternating between both satellites. These operations will allow them to start to drift to their final position. After two weeks, the satellites are stopped and very precisely positioned in orbit. This is how the team of ISOC, the ESA Operations Center in Darmstadt, and the team of CNES, located in Toulouse, work together. This working partnership provides a 24-hour post-launch operation service founded on the complementary skills of the two teams. Once more, the ambition of European projects is demonstrated by this kind of collaborative work. The members of the operational teams are drawn both from ESOC and CNES for the onboard operations as well as the operational ground coordination. But there is some specificity, like the ground software which is completely delegated to ISOC, or the tracking stations which are taken in charge by CNES. Finally, the flight dynamics operations use the skills of both centers. So we, we've tried to put together a team here that covers the, the real needs of operations. You know, both CNES and ESOC have experts in, in all the necessary areas. What is important for something as critical as this LEOP is to get the human aspects right. So we put together our teams, covering, making sure that people work well together. Did you finish uh, explaining the separation systems? So I just uh, finished with the four uh, mechanisms attached to the uh, four corners of the satellite. And a separation pyrotechnical boat uh, ensures the, the separation, actual separation. The boats are cut uh, of the satellite. And uh, this, uh, the, the velocity which is necessary for the satellite to get away from the dispenser is brought by a spring actu actuator which provides the uh, mechanical push for separation. So all the two satellites will be separated in opposite directions. We heard earlier from Blaise de Chantenay Area and Space talking about a graveyard orbit. Now what's that? Yes, uh, this is not the end for the frigate stage after separation. Uh, it will uh, move away from the uh, satellite's orbit for obvious reasons of known collisions, of yeah, course. Sure. And it will uh, follow a flyaway orbit. So there will be a third burn, which will be uh, given by the hydrogen thrusters of the stage, since we have almost no more propellant in the main state tanks, propellant tanks. And this flyaway orbit will uh, bring uh, the uh, frigate stage and the dispenser uh, on a graveyard orbit, which is, which is called a graveyard orbit, it's 400 kilometers, and uh, on this orbit, it's 400, 400, 400 kilometers above the above, above the sorry right? above yeah. the uh, satellite's orbit, and on this uh, orbit, uh, all the uh, fluid system will be depressurized and uh, rendered totally passive in order not to uh, to avoid any risk of explosion. We we would provoke, of course thousands of debris in space. Tense moments now as uh, we wait satellite uh, separation. Coming up in uh, very few seconds. Tonight represents years of work for many people here and around the world. And in Jupiter, you can see all eyes are focused on the computer screens and listening to what's happening uh, all their ears on the phones and in their headphones. Lots of emotion. Des satellites Galileo -Yové. There we are. Lots of emotion. Jean Yves Galavari and Space embracing Jean Jacques Bourdin of ISA. You can hear the applause. French Minister for Space in the uh, purple tie. And Antonio Tajani of the European Commission shaking hands. So we've had uh, the first good news on this uh, historic mission. The champagne and the cigars, no doubt, will be forthcoming. Now that the two satellites are up, the first uh, early orbit phase maneuvers consist of the solar yes. panel deployment. So th this is the, the start 
for the satellites. You can see how it happened just as you described it, pushed away from the mothership in opposite directions. Yes. So this is the start for the satellites, but also for the all the teams who are now working uh, in uh, relation with the satellites in Toulouse and in ESOC in Darmstadt, the uh, ESA center, uh, control center. And uh, all these teams will follow the satellites uh, during uh, several days to test all the systems on board and to check that uh, they can be made operational on time to deliver the first uh, services. A big moment here at the space base, an historic moment. And uh, you can see the smiling faces of everyone here from Ariane Space, um, the Space Center, the uh, French Space Agency, the ESA the team, space Agency, mission director, the, the Russian uh, program director, and uh, we're going to have another Director replay. Of operations. And after that, you've seen it before, but it's uh, magnificent. Do we don't have to use computer animations anymore for lo for in our films of launching uh, Soyuz because we've got the real <laughs> thing. We're going to uh, after this, we're going to be hearing from uh, Jean-Yves Legal. We'll have the traditional speeches. We'll be hearing from Mr. Legal and Mr. Dordain, I think, and uh, many others. While we're, while we're waiting for, for that, you wanted to mention a word about what they call passivization or neutralization of uh, what's neutralization. left of the Yes, so for any launch, uh, when you've re released the satellites on the final orbit, uh, you have to uh, make sure that the, the remaining bodies do not present a danger for the uh, space. Jean-Yves Legal is making his way to the podium, and he'll be the first uh, to speak right after the repay. M Mr. Legal, you have the floor. Bien. Eh bien, écoutez, vous avez applaudi. You know that. I, je n'ai pas de son dans le casque. Je n'ai pas de son dans le casque. So the first two satellites, first two satellites of the Galileo constellation. Sorry, we had a small technical problem. In any case, this is a story of Europe that succeeds. Europe that knows how to cooperate. What a road we have traveled since the end of the 1990s and the first studies on these two projects. How many difficulties, so many difficulties we have overcome so as to enable us uh, today with history glancing at us to celebrate the success of this Soyuz at the CSG and the success of Galileo. I would like first and foremost to thank our clients. Uh, ESA, the European Commission, Mr. Director General, Madam Director and Chairman, and thank them both twice. First, for having decided to entrust Ariane Espace with the launch of the entire Galileo constellation, using Ariane 5 and Soyuz, as we had suggested from the very start. And secondly, for having decided to launch the first satellites in the constellation on the first Soyuz at the CSG. And uh, you saw this yesterday. There's always a risk involved, but you took the risk, and clearly you were right to to do so. I would also like to thank all those who worked on preparing this launch, who carried out the first studies for the launch pad, who built it, who prepared the mission, and succeeded in carrying out this launch on the date that we had decided last May 12th. I'm thinking of ESA, of course, of the French Space Agency, CNES of Roscosmos, our industrial partners in Russia, in Europe, all the teams working here in Guyana. Congratulations to you all. And I really would like us all to give them a hand. Me. 
I would like also, and maybe especially, to pay a tribute to all of those to whom we owe the very existence of uh, Soyuz at the CSG. The first time I heard about this project was in April 1998, while I was on the banks of the Volga River, from Dmitry Kozlov, one of the fathers of the Soyuz launcher, and you could say, therefore, of astronautics in general. We convinced each other of the benefit of such a project for France, for Europe, and for Russia. We soon found out that it had been easier to convince ourselves than it was to convince all those we needed to carry it out. But we were lucky to find visionary people at EADS, at ESA, at CNES, CSKB Progress, Roscosmos, and Peolavichkin, and at SARSEM, who worked ceaselessly to bring this project to completion. Many of them came to be with us here today, and I think that uh, we should dedicate the success to them and we should give them a big hand because it really, they are worth it, as we say. Long before today's launch, the Soyuz and Guyana project was already a great success. We signed no less than 14 firm contracts before this first launch. From now on, each year, two to three Soyuz launchers will take off from the CSG alongside uh, Ariane 5 and Vega. I am sure that uh, Dmitry Kozlov is proud of the road we have traveled together over the years. This was a coming together of two worlds, of two cultures, of interests that sometimes differed, but that we were able in fine to converge. This is something extremely important. I will stop there. Now I have the honor of giving the floor to all of the uh, those who came to participate in this launch. And um, first of all, Mr. Dordain, Mr. Popovkin, uh, then Mr. Jankowski, Mr. Tajani, and Mr. Vauquier. Again, thank you. Ah, merci beaucoup. Uh... Thank you very much. I'm not sure that that's the correct protocol. I think it's really much more something of the order of an alphabetical order, let's say. In any case, one Soyuz, two Galileo, that's three successes for Europe in a single day. I think that uh, the dream has become a reality. But uh, in order for this to happen, there is, I mean, there's no secret about it. This means a great deal of work, a great deal of dedication, a huge number of problems that we have to resolve together. But the reward is really immediate. And that is this incredible feeling that we're all sharing today. I really have to say that we re really very strong feeling. So two Galileo uh, satellites, I have a confirmation that we indeed, uh, that these uh, Galileo satellites indeed will be, um, that we are in communication with them. They're on their orbit, 23,000 kilometers uh, away at um, 56 degree plane, uh, we will be deploying the solar arrays very soon. That's an important uh, moment because that's uh, onboard uh, power. Then for five days, we'll be carrying out all of the uh, orbital operation using two centers, Toulouse and Darmstadt, ESA's uh, center in Darmstadt, the national agencies and ESA work together. Ensuite, uh, then après les we will, after the uh, uh, orbital operations, we will be uh, handing over the responsibility of um, these operations to Space Opal, two sites, uh, uh, Fucina and uh, in Germany, in Bavaria, sorry, and the other station in Fucino. And uh, there will be 90 days of testing in orbit testing uh, from Rodu in Belgium. So you see that uh, all of the uh, centers are involved in uh, Galileo. And lastly, we will have the first navigation test after that 90 days day period of testing. So this is what is going to be happening with these first two satellites. And after that, we will have the next launches with Soyuz 
la date exacte sera fixée uh, of the next uh, Galileo satellite. Uh, the date will be set at the beginning of next year. It will be sometime in the summer. La, that will be after we have finalized the critical the definition uh, review uh, for the next satellite since the, we are basically in a continuous process voilà of uh, implementing uh, a whole constellation. So this is uh, what is going to be happening for all of those who are working on Galileo. Départ. This is just a starting point. Un point de départ pour Soyuz, à de uh, starting point for Soyuz de from here, from uh, French Guiana. Soyuz rentre en exploitation commerciale. Uh, we will Et start the commercial uh, Vega operations. Et and uh, le lanceur Vega, Vega is coming. And in fact, uh, Vega will be uh, delivered to Kourou uh, next Vega Monday. Sera aussi Vega will also be a reality in Kourou as early as next week. Uh, and so Soyuz, Vega, Ariane, three launchers on the equator at Rhymes in French, as Ariane Espace uh, says. And basically, that's going to be a completely new era. For 30 years, we lived with a single launcher. Starting January next year, we will have three launchers uh, in full operation here, and that will make a big difference. This is also a starting point for Galileo. As I said yesterday, Galileo is not a space program. It is a uh, system uh, for s providing services to citizens. We're going to be focusing on quality and reliability of the services provided by this constellation. And I am completely completely confident in this respect these will be the best services in the world because we use the best technologies in the world. Today, with the two Galileo satellites that are orbiting right now, we have atomic uh, clocks that are 10 times better than the atomic clocks that are presently in orbit. That up until now, they were manufactured in Switzerland and in Italy. We also have signal generators manufactured in Sweden, also in Italy. The best in the world, best technologies in the world, and therefore I am totally convinced that this will be the best service in the world. I would also like to thank all of those who made today a great success for Europe. When I say Europe, I'm talking about Europe, geographical Europe, since Russia is part of today's success. This is also the success of many individuals, those who are present here today, but also those who worked for 10 whole years. Some of them, unfortunately, even have left us, and I would really like to pay tribute to them because what we see here is a chain of individuals who have worked over the years, over these 10 years on this program. Among them, of course, I would like to thank the uh, ESA member states, uh, ESA. That is what ESA uh, is all about. The European Union, of course, the Commission, and Russia, which is a part of today's historic day. Of course, the Galileo Industries, and this has already been said, the uh, lead contractor is Astrium, Germany, and the integrator is Thales, Italy, and the uh, industries uh, uh, working around Soyuz, including, of course, uh, uh, the, the Russian industry, the Ariane Spas, uh, uh, individuals, of course, and new success of Ariane Spas, and the agency, the Connect Yes, my colleagues from the ESA, uh, the CNES, the Sp French Space Agency, uh, people in Toulouse who have uh, begun the uh, orbital operations, uh, the people present here are doing extraordinary work, the DLR, the uh, Italian uh, Space Agency, all of whom are doing fabulous work. You can be very proud because uh, really this is uh, history. There will be a before and after 21 October 2011, and this is not a chance matter. Uh, it is because you have made history and you deserve to uh, be a part of it. And uh, thank you. And Bolshoi uh, Spasiba. Is that wrong? <laughs> Mr. Popovkin understood, so maybe you didn't. <laughs> Thank you to everyone, and uh, congratulations. When we start the most important stage uh, for Russia, we fulfilled all our uh, duties the, we put by Russian uh, rocket to satellites on the orbit. And it's very difficult to speak now 
we need some more time in order to assess what has happened uh, today. Fifty years ago, the first uh, astronaut said, Let's, we, we, we are going, we, uh, we left or we lifted off. And that's uh, why I would like to thank uh, all teams that worked uh, with Russia from all different uh, 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 institution, ESA, Ariane Space, CNES, and I uh, thank you very much again. And we would like Galilei to travel a very long way, like GLONASS. Also. Distinguished uh, guests, Distinguished hosts, ladies and gentlemen, I am very happy that as the representative of the Polish presidency, uh, I have the opportunity to participate in such significant and simultaneously spectacular event, which is the launching of the first satellites of the Galileo system. By building its own satellite navigation system, a united Europe joins the countries already offering such systems. Launch of the Galileo system will create new opportunities for the use of satellite navigation in virtually all areas of social and economic life. Can anyone today imagine driving a car with a large, without a large and unwieldy map on your lap? Satellite navigation applications are effective management of human and material resources, save time, increase security, and help ecology. Galileo is a European system, but it has to serve people around the world. Therefore, it is built within a broad cooperation between different institutions on a global scale. Through this effort, a united Europe we have a technological contribution to the creation of an effective global network of cooperation between existing satellite navigation systems. Galileo is a system of high quality. It gives accurate and reliable navigation signal. I believe that it will be a catalyst for research centers. The availability of a new signal will give the industry a vast field for innovation. Thousands of applications will be created to facilitate the daily economic and social life. At the same time, Galileo should be a catalyst for small and medium-sized EU countries. These countries will be able to join more widely into the European Space Programme policy. I am pleased to announce here that Poland in the near term would like to finalize negotiations for the full membership in the European Space Agency. Today, we inaugurate the construction of the space segment of Galileo. There is still intensive work to create an effective system of financing and managing the program. Work on the Commission's proposal for the future of Galileo will be inaugurated at the time of the Polish presidency and continue in the coming year. Poland will in this matter closely cooperate with successive presidencies, Denmark and Cyprus. I believe that together we can really handle it. Ladies and gentlemen, Galileo, whose name bears our system, once said the famous sentence, maybe with time we will see things that today we cannot imagine. I think that that's what we have just witnessed is a perfect illustration of these words. Thank you for your attention. Monsieur le ministre, Monsieur le Commissaire. Minister, Mr. Commissioner, 
Dear friends from ESA, from CNES, from Ariane Spas, dear friends from the Russian Federation, today is a very important day. It is an historical day, not only for all of us, it is an historical day for Europe. Why? Not only because of the launch of the two first satellites of the Galileo project, which is a great European project, but because of the capacity that the European Union has of managing the governance of space. This is a wonderful message to convey two days before the meeting in Brussels of the European Council where economic governance is going to be discussed for our European Union. This will be a summit together with the summit on next, on next Wednesday, which will be important not only for us in Europe, but for the entire world. When Europe is capable of demonstrating that it is able and capable of managing space and the governance of space, which is not only scientific, it is also an economic governance. Well, this enables us to give hope, to convey a wonderful message to our state heads, to the president of the council, the president of the European Commission. So thanks to our dedication, all of ours. Thanks to the fact that we all worked hand in hand over all these years, we were able to demonstrate today that Europe exists, that Europe wants to do the right thing in Europe of space for its citizens and open the door also to Europe, to a friendly Europe, a friendly Europe with friendship with Russia. Uh, which is a member not of uh, the European Union, but uh, for the Europeans, and for Italians, it's very easy to talk about friendship with Russia. Uh, in any case, we want to strengthen this French. We're going to strengthen uh, this friendship. We're going to strengthen our cooperation with the African Union, great cooperations of this kind. Thanks to Europe, thanks to uh, European cooperation, to what you achieved today, what we achieved together over all these years. But today, uh, there's one thing I cannot forget. I cannot forget, I must, I feel I must mention a woman who is the mother of the Galileo Project, the former vice president of the Euro European Commission Loyola de Palacio, who unfortunately is no longer with us, but she is watching us. She's looking down at us. Uh, she committed very strongly to organizing this great European project. We must also thank my friend, my predecessor, Commissioner, Vice President, uh, Commissioner Jacques Barrault, a European. Uh, very European Frenchman who worked very well, who did excellent work. I'm, all I did was to uh, finalize all of his work, uh, all of the work of those who worked before me, Yoloyola and Jacques. I would like to thank them. Uh, I think that uh, we are in French Guiana, and therefore it's very important to recall the important work done by our friend Jacques Barrault. I say hello to Paris. Thanks to the press, I uh, hope that my message of uh, tribute and thanks will get to him. So, dear friends, the policy, the space policy of space, space policies, are very important for our economies, for the future of Europe. As I said, there are some days uh, this is actually a policy which is at the heart of the new industrial policy. We must commit very strongly to this area. We need this. This is not just entertainment. This is necessary for the competitiveness of our European Union in the world. It is important to open our doors. Yes, we must open. Uh, we must be competitive if we want to dialogue with Russia, with the African Union, because otherwise our counterpoints could, might choose other people to work with, which is why we must be very strongly committed. This is at the very core, as I said, of the third European Industrial Revolution, which is why we must move forward today, thanks to this launch, thanks to all the work done by everyone, by all of us, and I want to also thank the civil servants, 
of the European Commission and of the European Space Agency, of the Galileo Agency. I would like to thank Paul Weizen, the Deputy Director General, uh, 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 people in my uh, division and all of the people who have committed over the years to this great project. I would like to thank the former Director of uh, uh, who, uh, Mr. Le Mourour, who started working on uh, uh, Galileo, Mr. Rodota. I would like to thank Mr. Jacques Dortin, Jacques Dordain, who is also a friend, who has understood not only the scientific importance, but also the political importance of this project. Jean-Jacques, I would like to thank you once again. However, we will have an opportunity to work together a great deal. Let me tell you, today we are going to launch, we're going to initiate a tender, a call for bids by six to eight new satellites. Six weeks to submit the proposals, and on 1 February, Wednesday, Wednesday, 1 February, we will sign the new contracts. Thanks to this work, thanks to the commitment of each and every one of us, which is why I would like to thank you on behalf of the European taxpayer. We have saved by sticking to the timing, and thanks to today's launch, we have saved approximately 500 million euros. So the Commission is giving good news today. We have uh, complied with the timing, we have fulfilled the timing, and we are therefore saving money, the money of our citizens. Thanks to all of the work that has been done by all of us, which is why it's so important to continue. The Commission and Europe are capable and are in the process of managing this great project, which is a project that is fundamental for uh, our future, which is why we have decided, you heard this, uh, we have decided to give the names of two young students to these, uh, or pupils to these uh, students. Uh, I mean, the competition is uh, ongoing as we speak in all the European schools to give a new name uh, to the next satellites. And I'm hoping that in 2020, now I won't be commissioner anymore by that time, uh, I hope that I will have had the honor of organizing this task, uh, of having 30 European satellites for a Galileo project that will enable us to save 90 billion euros. That is what it is. This is a policy that will provide services to our European uh, citizens. This is not just research. I'm talking about politics, but of course, but services are necessary in the area of transportation, fishing, agriculture, social security, health, care, safety civil protection, thanks to Galileo, we will be able to save men and women, for instance, in the event of earthquakes or other natural disasters, uh, other disasters, which is why we are so strongly committed to this challenge. To conclude, because we are in France, because we are in this magnificent uh, territory of French Guiana, I would like to thank the French Republic for its commitment, for its support. I would like to thank the uh, Polish presidency as well. Uh, France has a great tradition, as has Italy, my country of origin. Uh, the, for uh, the, all of the, our countries, uh, space is very important. The space industry is very important. And again, I want to repeat, your support is very important at the European Commission to work in favor of this great European project, namely Project Galileo. I'm counting on French commitment. Uh, thank you for your hospitality. Thank you for all your work. And all of us together, we will be able to win this great challenge the challenge of space, of space for our European citizens. Again, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to congratulate with all my heart all of the people who worked in the Russian space industry, the French and European space industries, with the achievement of this historical result. Russia and France began cooperation in the space industry in 1966. 
Thanks to the initiative of uh, the great Frenchman General de Gaulle. And since then, we have uh, experienced a very important milestone, which was successfully achieved today on French territory in French Guiana. The historical significance of this launch is based on the fact that, firstly, we were able for the first time to unite the best aspects of French and Russian space industries. We took the most reliable launcher, um, middle-class uh, Soyuz, uh, which has uh, uh, been successful for many decades, from the very first flight of the Russian cosmonaut in 1961, and which to this day is used in order to carry out uh, various uh, space services um, in terms of uh, launching payloads. So Russian and French specialists developed a special Soyuz model, which they called the Soyuz uh, Special Tropical Soyuz, Soyuz ST, developed four launches from the very youngest and also most modern launch pad in French Guiana. And the uh, linkage between these two efforts and the efforts of our builders and engineers, our experts in uh, flight command, uh, space command, all of these made it possible to successfully carry out this launch. And the second historical aspect of this launch is the fact that this was carried out by the efforts of two flight command organizations, the French and the Russian. This is something which has never existed before in the history of uh, the space industry. And the work of these two groups and the successful launch of Soyuz ST from French Guiana are the epitome of uh, this process of many decades of work by the specialists in space, uh, the space industry of Russia and France. I would like to congratulate them and I would like to thank them for this huge achievement. We are now looking toward many more decades of launches from French Guiana and I am convinced that this program will be extremely beneficial both for the European Union and for the Russian Federation. Félicitations, congratulations, and uh, so you have a good trip from Guyana. Thank you very much. Mr. Vice President of the European Commission, dear Antonio, thank you for your commitment to Galileo. We know how uh, we have seen your consistent effort for lowering costs and the uh, for the success of the program we that began today. Mr. Minister, Mr. Zhenkovsky, thank you for your presence. You embody the commitment of the European Union and the importance of the ramp up of the European Union today in uh, space uh, competencies. Mr. President of the uh, African Union. Thank you for your friendly presence. Dear Vladimir, thank you for the extraordinary success that you embody. It is with Russia that this partnership uh, is built. It's with you that we want to partner in the future. You have demonstrated here in French Guiana the excellence of uh, Russian technology if it was necessary at all to make any such demonstration, since no one doubted it uh, here. Mr. President, dear uh, uh, Jean-Jacques Dordain, President of the uh, European Space Agency, you know how uh, France supports you, how important the development of European space policies are for us. We know that for you this is the uh, 
finalization uh, of a long period of work. Dear uh, Yannick Descata and all of your teams, you embody French excellence in uh, space policies, and it's, I'm very happy to, I will be very happy to go and say hello to a small part of your teams. Dear Jean-Yves Le Gall, uh, President of Ariane Espace, congratulations for this extraordinary success. We know how difficult this step was. I would also like to include all the French members of Parliament who are present here from either Guyana or France who have uh, demonstrated how uh, what a, the strong Republican consensus we have for the success of this policy. All the teams of ESA, CNES, Roscosmos, those who built the launch pad, the uh, ESA teams and the commission teams who handled the Galileo project, the Astrum teams, Talesa Alenia Space, who built the two IOV satellites, the Ariane Espace teams who uh, carried out the launch. This is your success, first and foremost. We are measuring, we measure, we have a good idea of the number of hours and days and years of perseverance that was required to achieve the success, and the number of minuscule details, uh, each of which required your utmost uh, diligence and uh, excellence. 1966, this was the first partnership uh, that was initiated by General de Gaulle, which for us Frenchmen uh, resounds in a very special way, the first partnership with Russia. This was a visionary partnership, and today it is uh, historically translated into a new tradition, which uh, with a dual dare, uh, a double dare with uh, both a European mission and an embodiment of the French-Russian uh, cooperation in a single launch with this uh, tight conjunction of uh, both Galileo's history and the history of Soyuz. Dear Vladimir, I would like to focus on the importance of this cooperation with Russia. If we look at our own history, the Cold War was embodied specifically around uh, the uh, space policy and the confrontation between uh, Europe, the USA and Russia in part was focused on uh, space. The strong single signal today is that the, our cooperation is also focused on space with uh, the addition of our uh, different uh, capacities. So use is the most reliable, middle class, uh, 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 medium class uh, launcher, and uh, with the longest service uh, in the world, to which we add our own know-how, uh, leading to probably one of the best performances for this type of product in the world. And secondly, Sergei Ivanov, uh, whom I was very happy to talk to uh, during these two days, this is an extraordinary human adventure, the encounter of two excellent scientific and, uh, cultures in the area of the space industry. We must continue this adventure. It must not be a one shot. We must be able to, um, we must be able to continue what began here in this human adventure. We must turn this into a future cooperation uh, uh, with the extraordinary new uh, avenues to explore that can further reinforce our cooperation. Vladimir, in fact, I wanted to ask you to thank your teams. Uh, please express our gratitude. They worked uh, a great deal yesterday to uh, uh, fix that uh, valve issue, uh, which was due to the fact that uh, they were working under slightly different conditions. This was really uh, proof, if any uh, uh, was needed, that your teams uh, are extremely competent. Uh, need we thank once again uh, Guyana and inhabitants of Guyana, all of us discovered a quite, lady, quite somewhat different uh, uh, type of climate here, but with the same warmth, uh, human warmth. Very quickly, I would like to take a look at the outlines of uh, the kind of uh, vision we should have of a European space policy. For France and for Europe, such a policy is based on the simple belief, which is that space is not a luxury. It is the con very condition of our competitiveness. It is the very condition of our competitiveness, first and foremost, because the services that are provided by uh, the space industry are in, um, more and more essential in all areas of our uh, daily life. No aircraft, no daily aircraft circulation without the Galileo system. No possibility of developing a software industry based on smartphones unless we have a total mastery of uh, satellite navigation through Galileo. No uh, road ambition or search and rescue ambition, such as Antonio, Antonio already began, began working on this without the support of uh, Galileo. For all of
with these technologies, and uh, Galileo is only an illustration thereof, uh, our autonomous, self-standing, independent access, reliable access to space is a key condition for all of this. Secondly, there's an issue of sovereignty. We must not neglect these aspects, even in a period of uh, globalization and internationalization. If we depend on a geolocation a system which is um, has a military base outside of Europe. That means overnight we could lose our autonomy in different scenarios, which could create a difficulty for the independence of Europe. And this is simply not acceptable, not possible. In other words, if we want to control our destiny, we have to control uh, our own access to space and our own capacity to invest. Then we have, of course, uh, we have the consumers on the one hand, we have sovereignty, and then we have a third aspect which is important, which is job creation, uh, corporate uh, development. As Antonio said, we must now be capable of developing all of the services to make sure that this is not only a technological success, but also a success in terms of uh, job creation and economic development. The second point I wanted to stress uh, briefly is uh, uh, are the next steps and the way in which we must continue to work together. First of all, Europe must agree to collectively uh, shoulder the costs linked to uh, the space industry. Space industry is expensive. It is a long-term industry. It requires uh, long-term investments. It is uh, essential that we are capable of supporting uh, such uh, long-term policies. In this point of view, uh, Antonio, you know this, France is one of the main European space uh, powers, is determined to uh, continue along this path, which is a path of French excellence, but which also uh, involves working hand in hand with all of our uh, European colleagues so as to achieve collectively our European programs, including with Russia. It is important for the European Union uh, to be able to implement the new Lisbon Treaty. We are working on this. We are uh, involved in this movement. We must completely move into this new area of competence. And Galileo is the first and wonderful uh, hands-on operational translation thereof. This uh, ramping up of uh, Europe's competency can, of course, uh, go through, and in our minds must go through, uh, the excellence of must lean on the excellence of our different agencies and the European Space Agency, based on the principle of subsidiarity, where the European Union, of course, has its own challenges, but can use all of of the uh, existing competencies in our different countries without having uh, to create redundant systems, especially when we all have already achieved a level of technological know-how uh, that can easily be uh, marshaled. I will end with the following simple idea. Europe needs pride. Europe should be pride, must be proud of its uh, researchers, experts, all of its agencies, its uh, everything that is part of today today's success that we've experienced today in the space industry. Europe needs ambition. Europe needs this pride. I'm convinced that uh, European ambition can uh, be best embodied, and even better than elsewhere, in this space policy. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Uh, ministers for these statements. Now, uh, the next time we see each other will be first in December. We will have another Soyuz launch uh, here. We will be launching uh, Pleiades, ELISA, and SSOT probably on 16 December. And in parallel to that, we will have a launch from Baikonur. At the very beginning of 2012, we will continue further uh, with some more premieres. We will have the first launch of Vega our baby. And naturally, after that, we will resume with Ariane 5 launches with an ATV sent to the International Space Station. So again, thank you. Uh, so we, uh, the years go by and the successes continue. So thank you very much and see you soon. Before we say goodbye, uh, Alex, any last words? Uh, yes, Josh. Uh, we had a lot of thrill and emotion during those last two days, but eventually we made it. Uh, I'm 
I'm more than happy to have participated to this fantastic event, which I'm sure is the start of a long series of successful launches. Thank you to all of you who have been with us all along these exciting hours. Goodbye, Josh. Thank you for your support. Goodbye, everybody. Be back in December for Soyuz mission number two. All right, that'll do it from us from, uh, from French Guiana. We're Tonight, the big news, the historic news, Soyuz has successfully carried out her maiden voyage from her new home in French Guiana, opening a new chapter in her long history, a new chapter for European and international business. Page with space history written tonight. We're glad you could be part of it. You'll be able to tell your grandchildren you were there. Next launch for December 16th. We'll see you then. Joshua Jample with Alex Medembasi on behalf of everyone at Arian Space Center, the Space Center. Thanks for being with us. See you next time.